Today we're going to be taking a look at how Rattata performs in a Pokemon Yellow solo run. Without too much foreshadowing or spoilers, I have to say that Rattata was a frustrating Pokemon to route at times, and the choice of what version to play, it really wasn't an easy one, but I think we're going to have fun today. At the very core of our success and failures today is the stats, and as a Route 1 rodent, it's about what you would expect. 218 base stat total, it's very low, and with 30 in HP, 35 in defense, and an extreme extremely bad base 25 special, this Pokemon is going to be a defensive liability in all stages of the game, and if you aren't careful, if you don't have things planned out, the resets can really start to rack up. There is a silver lining here though, 72 speed is actually pretty nice, it's going to be the strength of this Pokemon, and while 56 attack isn't the best, it is serviceable when you look at the level up learn set. It's no surprise that every move here is normal, and we'll talk about the TMs in a bit, but the key to success today is answering the question of how fast can we get to Hyper Fang. It's one of Rattata's signature moves, it's slightly weaker than like a premier normal move like Body Slam, and it's a side grade to Headbutt. It does have 10 more base power, but 10% less accuracy, and both of them have a flinch chance, but Hyper Fang's flinch only has a 10% proc rate. And before we go any further, I would like to say if you enjoy solo run content and you want to help the channel grow, likes and comments really go a long way, and if you are a returning subscriber like Master K, I do appreciate the support. And before you see how Rattata actually does in the video, I would like to know how you think it's going to do down below if you can spare a second of your time. The rules for the run are also in the description as well as an unlisted video if you maybe want to dive deeper into more detail and see some of the setup for these runs. And without further ado, I think it's time to grab yourself a Sodi Pop and let's see if this little rat can surprise us or if it's just the dirty little Route 1 rodent like it seems on paper. Ultimately, the decision to play Yellow version came down to the Brock split and Yellow does a lot of things to alleviate the the struggles that are found in the red and blue versions. First up, there's a couple of extra trainers to battle in Viridian Forest, but before we get to that, I do want to grind just a few wild Pokemon to go ahead and get Quick Attack at level 7. It's not only stronger than Tackle, but it also has higher accuracy, so it's just a solid upgrade around the board, just to make things a little bit faster. Another thing Yellow does is that it eliminates pretty much all the chances of getting poisoned like you might find in red versions specifically. Weedle is not a Pokemon that you're going to find in the wild here, and there's a couple of trainers they've had their Weedles swapped out for Caterpies like this first optional bug catcher here. I do battle all four of the optional trainers here and at the end the mandatory bug catcher also has had his Weedle swapped to a Caterpie and I do think this is a nice change because random poison it can just be annoying just to say the least. Now for this run we are done with Viridian Forest and it's time for some Light Years Junior Trainer Blackout Grinding. For those of you new this is where you battle the Junior Trainer in Pewter Gym that says you're Light Years away from facing Brock and you have the sole intention of strategically losing on the second Pokemon and that's going to be because trainers give 50% extra experience when compared to grinding wild Pokemon and overall either way you cut it it's just more efficient to gain levels this way. Our goal here is to hit level 14 for Hyper Fang and this brings me to the next way that yellow version makes this part of the game easier. In red and blue version the Light Years Junior Trainers Pokemon are a higher level and the main annoyance is the Sandshrew has Sand attack. We all know sand attack. Most of us normal people hate it except for a couple of psychopaths out there. And even if you were just going to battle this trainer normally, having sand attack it's enough to deter you from even wanting to try it. But in the specific case of blackout grinding, it does make things slower because now the AI has two different moves it can use so it can just spam sand attack. Whereas in yellow version, it only has scratch and overall it does make this grinding process much faster on top of making it more consistent. At the end of the day, I am going to repeat this process until I'm ready to actually beat the trainer and that's going to get us approximately to level 14 for Hyper Fang and after using a potion and healing up, I think it's time to take a look at Brock. The last thing that Yellow does in this Brock split to make the game easier is a complete nerf to Brock. His Pokemon are two levels lower than their red and blue counterparts, and a huge thing is the Geodude doesn't have Defense Curl, which can feel really awful when you only have resisted moves. 
Here, a single Tail Whip into Hyper Fangs does some honestly impressive damage, and even though we do take about half our health and damage total, I do get through this matchup easily enough. Next up is Onyx, and the goal here is 5 Tail Whips into Hyper Fang. It's worth noting that another yellow change is that Onyx does have an extra move in Bind, which it does hit me here, but overall that does lower the chances that it'll use Bide, that's B-I-D-E, and that could be a good thing depending on the run. Now in this run, Bide is actually welcome because it gives me more chances to set up Tail Whip, and at the end of the day, I do go down to just 10 HP, but the Tail Whips combined with Hyper Fang does shred his team, and that's gonna be the first hurdle of the game down. Now let's talk about red and blue version Rattata's run. And originally guys, I was gonna do both runs in the same video and kind of like a versus style thing, but I do have a busy summer lined up and I just couldn't play that many runs. But through my testing, it seems like about level 18 is likely what you're gonna want to make this one consistent. But do keep in mind that Geodude has defense curl and it has a 50-50 chance of picking which one it wants to use. And since you would actually need extra tail whips in red and blue, and the fact that defense curl is just gonna cancel that out and waste more turn it could make the fight much longer. Take all that and you combine it with all these ingredients of less trainers in Viridian Forest, the fact that the Light Years Blackout grinding can be slower, and the amount of time it would take to get a potential four extra levels, it made it a pretty slow split compared to the sub 30 minute split that we just achieved, and it just kind of outweighed having the easier late game in red and blue to me. I stream a lot of yellow version runs for basically the reasons I kind of just laid out, and it usually never fails that someone's going to get on there and tell me that, oh, yellow's much harder. And it's just simply not true. It's not, not true at all. If you want the opinion of someone that plays Pokemon week in and week out, it's just kind of like a side grade. And I do think it's a little bit ignorant to just to, just to blindly assume that yellow is going to be much tougher for every Pokemon and that every run is just going to be faster in red and blue because it's just simply not true. And I've proven that with several runs. And I would also like to emphasize that I'm not talking down on yellow version because I really do like it a lot. At the end of the day, I think these changes are great. And I personally wish they would take it even further by doing something like removing the guy that doesn't allow you to go to Route 3 until you beat Brock and then you could have even more training options if you needed it they could maybe move that guy to the entrance of Mount Moon and the flow of the game would still be the same but I digress with low base stats, this does mean that we'll need to do some optional battles and the first was the the bug catcher on route 3 that we've seen here but we can start to talk about Mount Moon The first order of business is to pick up Water Gun to learn, and now it's kind of a great time to take a look at that TM learn set I held off on earlier. For some reason, Gen 1 started this trend that's still going to this day of normal types just getting a ton of coverage, and Rattata, it has a pretty great selection of moves. We just picked up Water Gun, but it does also get things like Bubble Beam, Thunderbolt, and Blizzard, but do keep in mind that we only have 25 base special, but they are useful, and as far as the physical side of things go, a stabbed body slam and dig are also there to give some really solid options at various stages of the game. For optionals here, I'm going to be picking up the super nerd I mention him all the time, mention him too much, the double grass lass, and what's cool about water gun here is that it allows us to easily one shot the hacker for some easy experience, and water gun was really great for this portion of the game because it made things feel very efficient because I needed to find some geo dudes for some extra grinding just to kind of smooth out the experience in this early game without costing too much time. Now when we finally wrap up the end, we get done with Jesse and James. The extra training allows us to hit level 20 moving ahead into Cerulean, but Rattata, it does start to evolve at level 20, which means from this point on to the end of the game at every single level, I'm going to have to cancel its evolution, and that's just kind of the annoying reality that you have to deal with when you're doing these pre-evolved runs. Now, I'm going to beat this 25 special like a dead horse. I'm going to mention it once again, but it puts Misty off the table for now, and rival number two, realistically, is the only option we have, and I've sung Hyper Fang's praises already for doing well on Brock, but it really did speed up things and battles in the process of getting here and now when we look at rival number two it can one shot the Spiro, get it out of there that means we won't be taking any growls today now going into the sand shrew the plan here was if we took a sand attack i was going to swap over to quick attack but it just goes for a scratch hyper fang can two shot it and from there it's kind of an easy cleanup as rattata it just finishes off the battle pretty easy as far as nugget bridge goes 
I do use my remaining Hyper Fang PP before I return to heal because returning to the center to me is just faster than resorting to quick attack for this section of the game. And I've said this a million times, this contains the biggest cluster of mandatory trainers. So you want to make it as fast as possible. And the only extra thing to mention here is that I pick up the optional Onyx Hiker here because I got an experience breakpoint I want to hit in a little bit. After Bill, this is normally where you would take on Misty unless you're weak to water, but Rattata, it might as well be weak to all special moves. We've already talked about it. 20 25 base special. It's really bad guys, I gotta stress that to you. And in this optimized run, skipping Misty is the only thing that makes any sense because if you look at the numbers, you would see that you'd probably have a ton of resets because you don't outspeed Starmie and when you and outpacing it's just out of the question unless you get some extreme luck. But this does open up the chance to learn Dig. It's a solid move, but in this run it's pretty much just there for coverage since Hyper Fang's 120 effective power with Stab does over twice the damage of Dig considering that it's a two turn move. And from there, let's take this all the way down to the SS Anne. Now, there's a few more optimizations here. There's a couple of more trainers. The first door on the right here contains the puppy gentleman for some easy experience. And then it's time for Body Slam, which is a very welcome upgrade. And there's one last optional trainer here. It's the Fisherman. This one's two rooms down from the gentleman guarding the rare candy. We don't really have to take a look at that today. And that's going to lead us to rival number three. And we've upgraded since the last rival fight. And I don't even bother to heal because it's pretty easy. Now, it was a bit of a a risky play considering that I do actually take a couple of hits but there's no harm no foul body slam does its job I'm able to get past this one and we can move on since we skip misty I can't do lieutenant surge so I do gotta head back to cerulean to wrap up that unfinished business as for star you it's an easy one shot but the crucial thing that the subtle grinding that I've done is hitting level 27 that puts us exactly one speed ahead of star me this means that I strike first with a body slam and we can tank any one move outside of a bubble beam creep it, but here I just paralyze it, it misses its turn, and I take the battle right on the spot after that. And I'll go into more detail about this, but things like this are what makes Rattata a little bit frustrating. It really dominated the fight, but as you've seen, it just needed some extra levels because the stats just leave you lacking a lot. The trend of extra training to overcome its weak stats, it's something that we're going to see a lot more of, but for now, zero resets in a time of just a little bit over an hour isn't too bad. And Rattata has been impressive to me despite how its bad stats look, but I did make a mistake here. I'm going to call it out. I didn't learn both. Beam. I'm supposed to learn it immediately and I forget for a little bit after this it didn't really cost me anything but I do like to call myself out so I can learn from it later but I think we can skip past rock tunnel and we can take a look at what's happening in Celadon the rocket hideout is the first place to go and I did pick up some PP ups to use on body slam for this run with more optional grinding on the way and our heavy reliance on this move it just really saves you some trips back to the Poke Center and it made sense as for Giovanni, you can see that I still didn't learn Bubble Beam. And like I said, it was a mistake, but things that are double weak to it still go down in one hit, so ultimately it really didn't matter. Skipping Misty forces our hand at an early Celadon buy, and let me just call out that it's kind of absurd that we can learn Blizzard, but not the less powerful Ice Beam. There's no real logical reason for it, but it's just something I noticed. Overall, I get fresh water to get that sweet Saffron access, and for now, five proteins to bolster our attack will help out the most in the short term. Next Next up, I book it through Saffron and I backtrack to Vermilion. With Dig and only a single Raichu, there really isn't much to see here, but we do need to be able to use Fly outside of battle if we want this run to be any good at all, and the ability to learn Thunderbolt afterwards as a coverage move is great no matter how bad your special is. Keeping the pace going to Pokemon Tower, we can see that Thunderbolt doesn't even come close to one-shotting Bureau, and to make matters worse, a Growl hamstrings our attack, but thankfully, you generally outlevel this fight pretty hard, and things are still pretty clean. Now, I'd like to say the Body Slam crit at the end here helped, but I really don't think I was in danger of having to reset. As for the rest of the tower, I'm decently fast, I have Dig for the Gastlies, we don't really need to take a look at it. Now we're down in the Safari Zone and things are standard here. We're getting the vitamins, we're getting the final HMs of the run, and now we can start going through some of the routing quirks that Rattata brought to the table. This brings us to Silphco, and I'm here to basically battle every single trainer around. The low stats put you in this kind of like awkward position where even things like the much easier yellow version Erica is still really hard to get through, and with Rival 5 being tough as well as Koga's increased level, you really don't have any other options here except to go on that grind. But guys, let me tell you, you have to be extremely careful here. Now, I mentioned Rattata being a defensive liability, and look at this Machoke here on the 10th floor, decimate us with a low kick. 
and there are a ton of usually innocent trainers here in Sylph that could threaten a reset. And generally, I practice these runs and I'll do about three runs total to make the process of ranking each Pokemon similar. But Rattata is an exception. It got four runs and it's sections of the game like this. That's the reason why. Originally, I didn't put much thought into them and you know, I'm higher level. I'll just roll through all this stuff real quick. But if you aren't smart about this, if you don't plan it out and you do things in a certain order, you're going to have several resets. And I had to do an extra run because I had just a overall insane amount of resets here by the end of the run and I knew it was kind of preventable so I had to give it another shot. There's a grand total of 23 battles here when I wrap it all up and I'm level 44 at the end and today we're not going to be completing Sylph just yet. Rival number 5 is still a little too tough so I just dig out and now we're going to pursue other interest. And this is kind of a minor thing and I've been trying this strat here where you kind of hold off on this PP up if you want it and then you go get it now and you use the path for a shorter trip down to Erica and that's where we're going to be heading next. Inside of here I take on all of the higher experience trainers with middle stage Pokemon. There's four total and now we can just take a look at Erica. There's no need for an intro and the reason I held off for this fight after Sylph was because the ranges were horrible. I couldn't one shot any of her Pokemon and they got things like status moves like sleep and paralysis and poison and when you couple that with things like Razor Leaf you barely had any shot of winning. In practice I was trying to do something like hit level 35 for the damage rounding but the stats and the ranges they just they weren't there you could just try to luck your way through this but I do like to keep the resets down and I guess as you guys can see how things have went so far I did a pretty good job so far what's funny about Rattata is that this is our fourth gym now if someone told me a Pokemon was gonna have to grind up to level 45 and at that point it was only gonna have three badges then I would tell you that Pokemon must be garbage and this is what makes Rattata interesting to me because despite all of that there's still something there there's still something that's pretty good good inside of it. From there, the training never ends, and our top percentage, Rattata, is now off to the fighting dojo. There's no need to show all the battles, but if you try to do this earlier, you could have a bad time. Level 45 does put everything outside of the like one Machokin here into a one-shot range, and it's just kind of a quick boost of experience to get us over the hump of the next challenge. Now we are back down in Fuchsia, and what's strange about Yellow Version is that even though there's a lot of little balance changes littered throughout the game, they don't really touch the actual regular trainers. Things here like the jugglers they retain their red and blue levels despite Koga getting a huge level buff it's it's insignificant and doesn't matter but I always thought it was weird now this is kind of the stage of the game where we've done pretty much the most efficient grinding we can do and without going out of our way to get extra levels or hurting the end game by using candies now we have to start to make some concessions and this one's a little bit lighter than later ones but the first up is Koga In theory, this battle is simple. Body Slam is a two-shot range on every Pokemon, and I just need to maybe get a crit, or maybe they miss a move. I didn't think this one would be too bad, but the AI rarely plays nice and cooperates. Now, it starts out great. Turn one, crit, one shot. Turn two, Rattata, he has the cheat codes on, he crits again. Turn three, I get Toxic put on me, but two Body Slams moves us on, and we're at full health, and I was very excited to get through this one with no resets. And then, you, you guys already know, the Venomoth, it decides that, hey, I'm gonna Psychic crit, and it essentially puts me from 100% health down to zero, and impressively enough, I guess we had to have our first reset at some point, and let's just move to the next attempt. And here, things aren't as lucky as they were in the first attempt, but I still kind of bob and weave my way through the fight. I avoid some toxic attempts. I take a little bit of damage here and there, but at the end of the day, I'm still in a decent position. Turn one, I body slam for over half health, and I should be all right if it doesn't crit, but a non-crit psychic takes me all the way down to eight HP, and looking back at this run as a whole, it's kind of crazy how much damage these special moves did, but I do hang on, and this little rat flails its body to deliver the finishing blow. The significance of this battle isn't the speed badge boost, we're already pretty fast. The important thing here was all this kind of dancing around, avoiding hard battles, and doing extra training, it puts us up to level 48, and that damage rounding threshold at this specific level was pretty much your only win condition as we take a look at rival number 5. Level 48 does one huge and important thing here, and it makes Sand Slash into a comfortable two-shot range with Bubble Beam. If you let this thing linger, it can make life miserable, or it can start doing heavy damage with something like Slash, 
and this was the only way I found to make this fight reliable. As for the Cloister, and I guess this pretty much goes for all Pokemon in the game, but you just kind of hope it doesn't attack because I'm going to mention this like 300 times. We cannot tank a special move. Luckily, we do have Thunderbolt and two of them move us on. From there, the rest of the fight is significantly easier with Dig and Body Slam. It's all one shots from here on out. And I will point out that rival number five in yellow doesn't have an Alakazam yet, which does make this fight a little easier. But we'll talk about that a little more in a bit. But we knock out a tough battle without a reset, and that's always a positive. Now, now, my friends, what's better than one Celadon buy? Two Celadon buys, because we really need to polish off some stats if we want to keep things smooth. Overall here, we're picking up the Pokedoll for Mimic, and that was sort of a last second addition into the route. And while I do have a ton of money, the extra grinding and coming back to the Mart later means that your threshold for vitamins is almost filled up. But I am able to afford several Calciums. I get an extra Carbos and an extra HP up just because I can. Now it's time for that brisk swim, but for Rattata, this is not a vacation. I do some minor training inside of Pokemon Mansion, and this was kind of a fourth run optimization thing. It's not for any extra levels, but it was really important in manipulating our experience coming up, and we'll come back to that when it's relevant. As for the gym, I'm picking up all the trainers here, and for some reason in yellow version, you have to answer all the questions before you can do the battles. But the extra levels combined with Body Slam and Dig means that this one's fairly painless. And after we ponder the age-old question surrounding the mystery of Tombstoner, brother, we got a real fight on our hands with Blaine this week. When I was putting the puzzle pieces together and what I thought the best Rattata run would be, this is the one fight, it almost felt like a 50-50 coin flip. Now we have Dig and we do outspeed everything, but like we've seen many times, we simply do not have the stats to one-shot things and when you're a frail little piece of paper, we know what the results can be. On this first attempt, you've seen that it's gone perfect. I make it through without much opposition and this it's just how you draw it up, but the AI decides that it wants to win, so let's take a look at this extremely frustrating end to what looks like a first try victory. I outspeed, I hit the dig for good damage, and it goes for flamethrower. We know it does a ton of damage, but I do survive, but Blaine gets the burn proc, and I'm just sitting here in disbelief because I already know that the attack drop means that I can't knock it out now, and it's going to be the second reset. It's inevitable. And from there, we do not need to see all the attempts, but I do have six, a whopping six additional resets. It's not great. And there was some really close calls, whether it be getting chipped down by Ninetales or Rapidash. Maybe I take a Growl, or maybe I get walled by like a Reflect on the Arcanine. Maybe I get Crit, or just whatever the case may be. It was pretty frustrating. And as much as I would love to fit in more grinding, maybe use some candies, I simply could not. And while it would have been really great not to reset here, it's just important to know that this one was kind of just a concession on the run. And I knew it was inconsistent going into it. Eventually, I do get it down, but this one was pretty rough, and it may Maybe take a closer look at red and blue when I was practicing, but let's keep it going and let's see how the rat recovers after a pretty tough outing. After that I backtrack to Saffron and I do pick up Mimic and now it's time to kind of wrap up Sabrina and you might think that maybe going here first would be the play over Blaine, but it wouldn't have put me over the top to handle that. In this fourth run I did cut out a Carbos in favor of extra training and there was really only one spot that it really helped so let's talk about the significance of that and I guess I should say why I thought I could cut it out because originally I was worried about the high damage from her high special Pokemon and the extra Carbos allowed me to level up and outspeed the Alakazam. But here you can just see that we easily just kind of body slam our way through this one and I thought the extra battles were worth more than outspeeding this fight because it wasn't that bad in practice. Now we only have one gym left and it's no surprise that extra battles are on the table. They're for dinner once again. There's nothing to really note as far as the Giovanni goons go but this is where that last second Mimic edition came into play. I didn't need Mimic in practice. I was, you know, I was beating the game pretty comfortable, but for some added consistency, I do learn it for this battle because it can be quite the hassle when you're using the standard learn set. The trio is the lead, and no matter what, I outspeed it and one-shot it so we don't have to waste our breath talking about it. Persian is second, and I'm going to be using Mimic on double team here. Now let me say I don't love this strategy, but it does fit within the rules. But just kind of like how I feel about being able to skip the rocket hideout with the Pokedon, this is almost kind of like a pseudo skip for the toughest gym leader in the game, and sometimes it kind of feels borderline cheaty, but it is what it is. For Rattata specifically, it's not really about the evasion, but it's rather the badge boost glitch and 
five of them will put everything into a guaranteed one-shot range outside of the Rhydon. And remember those extra battles in Pokemon Mansion? Those were to manipulate my experience so I didn't level up during the fight and I could take those boosts into Rhydon. Now things go great here, but when I make it to the Rhydon, it shows us why double team strats can be really frustrating. And despite me having five stages of increased invasion, it just decides it's going to hit the 90% accurate rock slide on me. Now I don't want to sound like a sore loser, but these kind of resets, they're the ones that I despise the most. On the next attempt, I do the same exact strategy, but the Persian kind of pops off on me. And after hitting through my evasion two separate times, I'm down to just a mere 16 HP, but the evasion means that I still have a shot and since I can one shot the two Nidos it kind of just came down to if the Rhydon can hit its one move it doesn't and I take the battle overall this is yellow version Giovanni so I can't be too upset about having only a single reset here but sometimes the computer cheats and I just I want the computer to know that I hate it as far as the double team mimic strat goes I do think it's creative it is useful but it does feel a little cheap but for the most part the only alternative would be like grinding up an extreme amount or maybe using all your candies and in this run that really doesn't feel like uh, both of those don't feel like an appealing situation. So for now and likely in the future, I'm not really going to make any changes, but it is just interesting to talk about and bring it up a discussion about it. The only thing to show before I go into the next battle is that it's time to learn Blizzard. Mimic is normally a really great move in Gen 1, but like I've said a couple of times, this was a last second addition and we were only going to use it for the one single fight. It does sound kind of weird, but seeing these things that you don't see very often is what makes doing these runs a little interesting. So we could just hop into rival number six. Blizzard is a godsend here, and it's not only super effective against his two Pokemon, but it's a guaranteed one shot, and that's kind of a night and day difference to how most of these fights have gone so far on the run. The Cloyster hits me with a move, but notice its level, and notice how little damage it does, which is pretty strange in a run where we've been scared of special attacks the whole time. And this is a fight where the pacing of yellow feels off to me. I'm fighting against Pokemon in the mid 40s when I just got through this huge gauntlet of going through these tough fights where they go all the way up to the mid 50s and I just pretty much roll over it. We have solid top coverage. We really don't have to dive too deep into this one. It just wasn't that bad. It does feel a little bizarre, but you really can't let your guard down because there are some tough battles ahead. And to prepare for that final gauntlet, I do pick up the rare candy in Victory Road. Now remember, we've held off on using any candies to this point. So we do have 11, but Rattata, it's not done training yet. I crack that whip, let's get back to work. There's gonna be eight total extra battles in Victory Road. I pick them up just to squeeze out the maximum level I can. But these aren't that bad, there's no need to go into them. There are some specifically lucrative ones, like there's some cool trainers, the one with the Chansey, and there's some other ones at the end, like this one here with all the water types. And when I'm done, that does push me up to level 61, and I can use all 11 of my rare candies. That will push me to level 72, and now I think we can take a look at the Elite Four. Believe it or not, Lorelei is the worst fight in the Elite Four. I have no doubt that level 73 would help here, but I'm not sure where I'd fit in that training, so let's just take it step by step here. A Growl or an Aurora Beam attack drop, that's pretty much certain doom for you, but you can see here in the footage that I'm making it through this fight rather easy, and by the time I wrap up the Jinx, I'm still in green health, I'm on the Lapras, and let's take a look at what makes this fight difficult. I hit with Body Slam, it does around half health, then I tank a Hydro Pump, and you would think this one's over, but my friends, let's take a look at these damage ranges for Lapras. And while you might think a 70% two shot looks pretty good, I don't get that range and I take another reset. On the next attempt, I'm just, I'm chipped down from earlier in the fight and that already puts me in hydro pump range. So that's another reset right here. And on the next reset, it's gonna be the same thing. I play it pretty perfect, but 70%, it's not high enough. And that's yet another bad luck reset. Finally, I do get it to fall and there's really not much to say about it. I had this one planned out pretty well. It was pretty meticulously crafted and it just turned out to not go my way today, but that's just how it goes sometimes, guys. Now this run is still solid. Let's keep our head up let's move on to Bruno and we can just run through this one real quick you do have to rely on Blizzard quite a few times here uh, the two onyxes and the Hitmonchan since it has counter and high defense but it's pretty straightforward overall now with how my luck was going this run I figured that I would see like a submission crit from the Machamp 
but that's the second Elite Four member down. As for Agatha, I would say this one is one of the more intriguing reasons why I kept working on Rattata's time. Persian is a very similar run, but its one fault was its inability to handle ghost types, but with Dig and Rattata's arsenal, we blow through this one. Now there is only a 50-50 chance to knock out the Golbat, and like every other battle, the dominoes, they just wasn't falling, I don't get the one shot, but this one overall was pretty clean, it was a, it's a pretty consistent fight, we can move on once again. Lance is up, and we do have Thunderbolt, so this one is easy, right? And it is in this run. Just like with Golbat in the last fight, our low special means that it's basically a 50-50 shot to take out the Gyarados, but for once, I actually hit my range, and barring something like a Blizzard missing, maybe me getting crit by a move, this one's all but over. We do outspeed everything, we hit our moves here, and after a really rough start to the Elite Four, we're already at the champion, we're cruising, and let's see how the finale plays out. Sanctuary is first, and there's no messing around. I let a blizzard loose, it's enough for the one shot. Our high level also lets us outspeed the Alakazam, and Body Slam is just what the doctor ordered. Executor's next, it's really tanky, but the silver lining is that blizzard is a two shot. I do take a stomp for my troubles, I actually hit the range, and things are looking pretty great. Now I have great answers for the rest of the fight, I have dig for Magneton, I go first, I banish these magnets back to the refrigerator, but up next is Cloyster. Thunderbolt connects, it's not a one shot, but the computer, it decides to give me one last parting gift by letting the ice beam crit, and after dominating for the last few battles, we have a deep reset. Now jumping back into the same spot on the next attempt, I hit hard, it replies with an aurora beam. There's no crit, but guys, who would have thought? I see the attack drop here, which might very well set up another reset, but let's keep going and see how it played out. Flareon is weak to dig, and normally it's an easy one shot, but I move first, I dig underground, and the AI makes a fatal error. It goes for quick attack. That essentially means that it forfeits its turn. I was already underground, so it missed anyway, and even though I can't one shot it with the attack drop, I get to move twice, and that means after a second dig, this one is over, and the run is over. And that's it, Rattata has done it. With a final time of 3 hours, 37 minutes, and 16 seconds, this one was much better than I thought it would be. Now in the opening of the video, I talked about how it's frustrating, and that's because there's actually a pretty good Pokemon underneath some of the issues here. 12 resets is not the best, but the bulk of those resets came on two fights, Blaine and Lorelei. And I'm sure like on any other day, if you're getting the dice to roll in your favor, you could easily cut this in half. But like I said, this is my fourth run, we were already over capacity, so it is what it is, I'm happy with it. As far as the tier list goes, I think after Jinx, before Marowak is about the way to go. Now I probably talked about this on stream a couple of times, but I do think that the answer is to probably start making resets count as maybe like... 20 seconds per reset after the first two or three. I haven't nailed it down yet. We haven't done it officially, but it's just something I've been playing with. But I do think that's a pretty good result. I don't have my most recent streams up here yet, but as far as tier list goes, it's pretty high up there in terms of pre-evolved Pokemon. It's a lot better, and I just think this one did better than I thought. Now, if you think Rattata could do better in red and blue, which I don't think it can do just by judging by the doubly long Brock split, I'd be more than happy to do it on stream or something, but you have to let me know. And I think my biggest take away from this is I think Raticate can be a real surprise run because think about it, Rattata was pretty good, but you just have something that has better starting moves, higher stats. I think just those two things can really push it really high and I'm interested to do that. But I do think that's about the end for me. Special shout out to my channel members. I really do appreciate the support. And I guess at the very end of this video for the people sticking around, maybe you're wondering why I'm not doing all Alolan Summer Run. I'll explain it a little better in a later video, but there's been some dips in my performance and I thought it would be detrimental to the channel to just do cross-gen run after cross-gen run after cross-gen run. So I, I pulled back a little bit. We're going to be releasing some videos in between, but hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. And I got some videos to work on before uh, I go out of the country for a couple of weeks. So I'll see you on the next one. Bye.